We're in the last few verses of 1 Thessalonians 5 today. Thessalonians, just for those of you who are tuning in for the first time or maybe you're visiting us today, Thessalonians is an epistle, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, written by the Apostle Paul to a church that he planted in the in the Macedonian city, the Greek city of Thessalonica. Today it's called Thessaloniki. And Paul writes this letter after planting this brand new church. They're a year old when, he get, when they get this letter from him. And I think it's important for us to remember, to keep in mind, that these believers came out of a pure, most of them, some of them out of the synagogue, so they would have had an understanding of the Old Testament, but most of them out of pagan rituals. They were saved out of pagan rituals in temples and no understanding of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No understanding of the history of Israel, Moses. Whoever preached to them would have had to have laid the foundation like a lot of pastors are needing to do, even in the Western world today, laying a foundation for people. Used to be in in America, you could preach to people who had a rudimentary understanding of Scripture. And so you could talk about Paul or Moses or Abraham, and people generally understood what you mean. But But even back when I was an associate pastor in San Diego, which was eons ago, and I taught a Sunday school class of middle adults, and and I talked about Paul, and one of the young ladies came to me after and said, who's this Paul person you keep talking about, right? So that's what these believers were like in Thessalonica. No understanding. Paul had laid a foundation for three weeks. I can't even imagine. What a daunting task. Three weeks he'd laid the foundation of the gospel with them. Many had come to Christ. And then he left. And yes, Timothy had visited. But basically, they'd been on their own with no scripture, no Old Testament access to it, and and no New Testaments being written. So I feel for these people. I mean, they're struggling from ground zero. And now one year has passed, and Paul has gotten reports. He's in Corinth, down in Achaia, which is now southern Greece. He's in Corinth, and he's gotten reports from Timothy and others about what's happening in the church, this brand new church. And he's writing them to help them come to terms with their faith. And we've spent the last few months unpacking the first five chapters. And and honestly, just to be honest with you, preaching, particularly through epistles, is one of the favorite things I do. One of the hardest things for me to do is preaching on a theme or a topic uh, because then you're kind of grabbing thoughts and and hopefully depending on the Holy Spirit. But, But preaching like this is very easy because with each passage that's coming, I get my yellow pad out and I begin immediately to diagram the verses. And most of the time, which sometime I'd love to teach a class here on on scriptural diagramming because a lot of times what's in there, even the outline is embedded by the Holy Spirit and just peels out for you through the diagramming process. So, So we finally, after 10, this is the 10th sermon. And this is something else. They told us years ago that if you were going to have a decent sized church, the most you could do is preach a three to four week series because nobody's attention span is longer than that. Right? I think that's stupid. Um, And so, I mean, when we were in Cedar Rapids, I was in Romans for a year and a half. And if every passage of scripture is fresh and the Holy Spirit wrote it and it's his and he makes it fresh, then then it should be just fine. All right? So here we are in the last 14 verses and they're like, you know, a lot of times when a preacher preaches a sermon, we like to have one theme so that everybody goes home with that thought. Pastor Simbola is a master at it so that everybody goes home easily. This can't be put into one thought because it's like machine gun, rapid fire, final instructions beginning in verse 12. And you need to know in these 14 verses, 
the verbs, when you understand that, and I'm no Greek scholar, but I, I'm able to do the legwork. The verbs have the intensity of commands. It, so these, these, these instructions, these rapid fire instructions are not like, like in that movie about the pirates of the Caribbean where they talk about the pirate's code, right? And then at the end, Jack, whatever his name is, says it's not really a code, it's just suggestions, right? These are not suggestions. In fact, two words come out from this passage where Paul actually uses the word urge and another word command. But that is even just part of the understanding that the verb tenses are very intense in these 14 verses. Now, before we jump into these 12 verses and you look ahead, one of the things that that I like and dislike, I love and hate about preaching a series, I love that, that each Monday I can start working in the verses that are, that are ahead. And I love that there's some predictability to it. It is much harder, just honestly, to seek the Lord about what's, what he wants next when you're off script and off of a series, which is perfectly fine and a great way to preach also. But, um, but when, you're, when you're in a sermon series and you run into verses, I hate it because you run into verses you just soon not preach, right? Like given my English background, my British background, talking about sex besides just with Rita is very, very awkward. Even when I, even when the last time I preached on this, on that word out of this text, Catherine had her fingers in her ears on the front row. And it's very difficult for me. It's very awkward. To, so there are certain subjects that you can't, you can't really avoid. So on Monday, when I pulled out and started diagramming the last 14 verses, when I read the first verse, verse 12, I thought, oh, shoot. <laughs> I can't preach on this. So let's pretend those 14 verses aren't there. And next Sunday, we're going to start on second. We're in second Thessalonians today. I wanted to do that, and I thought, no, that'd be chicken way. Because after all, it is God's word, and it is the inspired word of the Holy. Now you're really anxious to know what's coming, right? So take your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, and let's dive in. And I've got three major categories, if you're looking to hang these rapid-fire instructions. I got three major categories. And the first category is for everybody that's here that is under authority. And let me, just, let, me, let me just tell you what I mean by that. I believe God has authority in the home. I believe God has authority in business, in the places of business. God has authority in governance. And God has authority structure in the local church. So if you're under authority at work, at home, uh, at, in whatever c- capacity, even though this text, when you get into it, you're going to see it is specifically about the church in Thessalonica, but God's instructions about authority and, su- and submission to authority is way broader than just the local church. So, so this first category, raise your hand if you are under authority in some place in your life, okay? And if you're not raising your hand, you need to repent, Okay, we'll have an altar call for you later. Okay, so every one of us are under authority in some place or another in our lives. At work, at school, uh, in ministry, we're under authority. In the family, we're under authority. So Paul writes, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. You can see why I didn't want to preach on this. I'll just leave it for a guest speaker to touch on this. But again, I think that would have been a chicken way for me to to handle this. Now, a leader is someone that has been granted a role of management. A leader is someone who's been given a role by God that is in charge of a family or a business or a ministry. A lot of times if people don't know the Lord and they don't recognize spiritual authority, they have trouble with it in any one of those settings. But but in reality, God is a God of order and the kingdom of God that he's establishing through us and in us 
provides leadership so that there's order. God moves within order, order in the family, order in the business world, order in governance in the nation, and order in the local church. It's God's way of bringing order, and God is a God of order. Now, quickly, that doesn't make people, here's where we get into trouble. That doesn't make, on both sides of the equation, this doesn't make the people who have that role of leadership superior. And the problem, we get into problems when we start acting like the role of leadership we have gives us superiority in any of those settings, or listen, or privilege in any of those settings. It, it, I don't know how Pastor Jan feels. I think he's the only former senior pastor here. But, but whenever I hear other pastors, my colleagues around, talking about my church or my board or my class or my staff or my choir, or, it makes me nervous. Because that assumes that we have some sort of privilege. No, God has simply given leadership as a way of sustaining order so that in the home, in the church, in the business, in the nation, life is not a free-for-all. And one of the risks we're running into in this nation right now is because life is, is that life is becoming a free-for-all. And we're seeing it in way too many settings. It's becoming chaotic. And God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. In fact, when he entered the scene, he was here before that, but in Genesis 1-1, and saw that the world was at, without form or void. It was chaotic. And the Holy Spirit was already close by, hovering, the past passage says, waiting for instructions from the Father to bring order to the chaos. And leadership in any setting is a role. It's just a role. Hard for us in our humanity to separate that from superiority or privilege. But it's recognizing that, that, that God is at work through leadership. And the other word in that verse is honoring those. And that word honor doesn't mean bowing down and paying homage to. That word honor in the Greek literally means just to recognize and acknowledge the role that that lead. So you're acknowledging the role, not even really the person, but acknowledging that God has put that person in that role in order to provide order in that institution or family. And it's a recognition of that role wherever you find authority or leadership. It's a recognition of that role. And then in other passages in the New Testament that use the word submission, it talks about coming, being willing to come under that role of leadership. And that's how we get to, to order. But Paul goes on in verse 13a, show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Now the word respect simply means to be guided in your relationship with them by considering the role that they're in. So your relationship and interaction with people who are in leadership is to be guided by your understanding and recognition that this is a role that God has given them and I'm going to respond in accordance with that role, which is actually what the word respect means. The phrase wholehearted love is a tough one because it literally means to love beyond the furthest degree. And that's something only the Holy Spirit can do. Because we're talking about people, people who are flawed, people who make mistakes. And so loving beyond all the highest degree is something, honestly, only, only the Holy Spirit can do in us. Because that's a high mark. Living beyond the high, loving beyond the highest degree of order is, is a high mark. Now these verses are understandably hard for a pastor to preach. And we're pretty much done with them, so you can all loosen your seatbelts just a little bit. But they're difficult for a pastor to preach because it had e could easily look like I'm simply trying to elicit support for my leadership. But before the Lord this morning, that's not my task. I argued with him about even preaching this text, but I felt like I needed to be true to all the verses if we're going to preach all the verses of 1 Thessalonians. 
But what we've got to keep in mind, just very quickly, let me, let me balance the balance sheet a little bit. What we've got to keep in mind is the Bible's expectations of all of those in the family, at work, in institutions, in the church, all of us who fill a role of authority and leadership have a high mark that God holds us to. And let me just give you a few verses that I studied about this just to show you that God has balance. In fact, can I just digress even from my notes for a minute to say wherever you find passages that seem hard, like, like Ephesians 5, wives submit to your husbands, okay? And that almost assumes that the wife is in an inferior role and the husband is somehow superior. But what we forget when we preach wives submit to your husband, I got the ladies' attentions right now. What, what we forget is that in the verse preceding that, it says we're to be, all of us submit to one another. And so that is more of a face-to-face -face relationship and a recognition of the husband's role in the house and the family is simply a role of leadership and servanthood. And here's what Jesus says to his disciples, to his disciples in Mark 9. Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. So if you want to walk in the role of leadership in whatever capacity God has given you leadership, the, the way to do that, God's word says, and it's not in the text in Thessalonians, but I felt like I needed to bring a balance to the, to the wholeheartedly love your leaders by saying that the scripture says the only way to do that and be in leadership is to do it with a servant's heart. Paul tells Timothy, if someone aspires in 1 Timothy 3 to be a church leader, they desire an honorable position. So a church leader must be, and then I just quickly listed them from that passage, above reproach, faithful to his wife, exercising self-control, have a good reputation, must be gentle, not quarrelsome, cannot love money, and must manage his family well. So you see how, whether it's Ephesians about submission or whether it's here, the word of God has a balance so that nobody can act like they're big shots. In fact, when you look at church history, particularly in the last 50 years in America, the problems of leaders that have splashed across the headlines and brought shame on the name of Jesus have been because people became big shots. And when you become a big shot, you're not open to listening to anybody. You're not open to conversation. You're not open to correction. And you've forgotten somewhere along the line that you're to be a servant to all, right? Paul follows that up in 1 Timothy with a servant of the Lord must not, be, must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Jesus taught his disciples, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people, act like big shots. Officials flaunt their authority over those under them. In fact, the minute you tell somebody, you're to be submitted to me, I'm in charge here, you've just lost, you've just lost your ability to be in charge. That's, that's not in the text, I know that. But, but among you, it will be different but among you will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. A consistent structure in scripture and command in scripture for how those in leadership are supposed to function under God. Our culture has a very difficult time in America with our rugged independence Beginning all the way with the War of Independence, we got this rugged individualism and independence, and we have a struggle with authority. And it's a painful lesson for us to learn that it's hard for us, anyone, to be in authority if they're not willing to be under authority. Now, do leaders make mistakes? Absolutely, because we're human. But God has even provision for that. In other words, when you look at the life of Moses... And Moses made one serious mistake. He let the people get to him to the point where his anger boiled over. And when God said, speak to the rock, 
right? When you read the passage, it wasn't just the fact that he struck the rock, but he was so ticked off that he said, all right, you people, I'm gonna show you who's gonna give you water. I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, not much. And that was it. God said, you, did, God said, you didn't honor me in front of the people. And as a result, he didn't get going to promised land. Joshua, in the heat of the moment, when the Gibeonites were looking to strike a, a treaty with Israel, forgot the word of God that said, when you get in the land, don't make treaties with anybody. And he got rash in his leadership and made a hasty decision because he was convinced by the circumstances instead of being convinced by the Lord. And he looked at the circumstances and made a judgment and he said, let's just go ahead and strike a, a treaty with these people. And the Gibeonites, when you read the rest of, of, of Joshua, the book of Joshua, turned out to be a thorn in his side for the rest of his life. So, so there's, a, there's a sense in which all leadership in the home, in, in the workplace, at church, wherever we are as we exercise leadership. All leadership is ultimately going to be answerable to God, which is why James writes, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. We got to answer to God. Ultimately, we got to stand before God for the exercise. And then Paul wraps up this section for those of us who are living under authority by saying, the, here's the ultimate goal, live peaceably with each other. And that's true in the home, it's true in the workplace, it's true here at Westgate, it's true, live peaceably. God's, God's basic desire is that through all of the exercise of leadership and submission to leadership, his goal is that we would to live peaceably because when we're living peaceably with each other, then there's no distraction from the kingdom of God being advanced. All right? Okay, now you can loosen your seat belts. Let's go to instructions for those who are in authority. Okay, so here's what Paul says those of us who are in authority need to be doing. And, and in every setting where God has you, as you exercise leadership or we exercise leadership, here they are. This is where the machine gun comes in. Warn those who are lazy. Okay? This is, I don't know about anybody in this room, but I got to tell you, confrontation and confronting difficult situations is one of my huge weak points. I, I do terribly at it. I just don't, I don't, yeah, I just, it's, it's, it's not good. And, and so this, I think, oh my goodness, let's let someone else warn those who are lazy. And, and the word lazy literally means, interestingly, it means not in battle readiness. So it's not just lazy because you sit around on Saturday morning reading a novel on the front porch instead of whatever, uh, mowing the lawn. Uh, but it is, it is not in battle readiness. Now suddenly that raises the bar of this whole thing to, to a different level because, it, because the purpose here is that we be in battle readiness. God's been saying this to us here at Westgate in capital letters for six months. So it's time for us to all be in battle readiness right? It's critical for the Christian life. Next, encourage those who are timid. And timid literally there means faint-hearted or discouraged or losing heart. Somehow the Lord has to give us spiritual discernment and insight so that we can see each other's lives closely enough, which is why it's so important to be in small groups in some way so that we can see each other and find out those in a setting like this, it's hard to tell because we all put on a good front and we all lift our hands in worship and we all smile. How's it going? Just great, thank you. But inside, some of us sometimes are faint-hearted and ready to throw in the towel, ready to stop dipping in the Jordan River. And we need to find who you are and be able to come alongside you and encourage. So encourage those. That next, take tender care of those who are weak. And we're not just talking about those here who uh, don't 
have the A-type personality and are not aggressive in their personality. We're talking, according to the Greek there, is those who are lacking in moral strength or courage. So if there, there are those in the body. See, this is all, this is why groups, being in some sort of smaller group, a ministry group or a home small group, this is so important because you'd never know these things in a corporate setting. And it was why, to me, getting back together again, even in the middle of COVID, was non-negotiable. Because we've got to be in a place where we can find out who's timid right now and who's right now getting lacking in moral strength and courage so we can come alongside. It's why living at the New Heart Place home for a year is so critically important because the guys and soon to be the ladies will come in lacking moral strength and courage and through encouragement and in the word of God and being in prayer and being in worship, we get, they get moral strength and courage. But we're living close enough to each other there that, they, that those who are lacking moral courage, who are about ready to give in to temptation, can't even be identified. So somehow we've got to, I know, I know God's actually speaking. I'm speaking out of turn here, but I do that frequently. God's giving Pastor Aaron and Anna some insight, which we haven't had a chance to even talk about yet, about some way more intentional discipleship. It's happening in CCMC. It happens in basic training. It happens in many places. Make sure you put yourself in a place where that's happening. All right? Next one. See to it no one pays back. Uh, oh, sorry. Be patient with, eat with everyone. I forgot that one. And patient means even-tempered while going through trying circumstances. Okay, how am I doing on time? We're doing okay. See to it that no one pays back evil for evil. And we would pray that that doesn't happen in the church of Jesus Christ. But since we're all human, there are times when I'm sure that that happens. But always try to do good, verse 15, to each other and to all people. Try to do good, all right? It's very quiet out there. I know it's hard to take in. And here, here's the last general out. So for those under authority, for those in authority, was the list of verses I just went over with you. And the last one, these are instructions for everybody. As Paul wraps up 1 Thessalonians 5. This is for everybody. Always be joyful. And the word joyful literally means be happy. I thought about that song that was popular 20 years ago. Be happy, right? And Rita's mom, Rita always tell, Pastor Rita always tells us that when she was growing up, if, they, if as kids they got grumpy and Grandma Dini would say, oh, you're sad? Get happy, <laughs> right? Be happy, be joyful. Never stop praying, verse 17. Oh, man. This is so critical right now, right? Never stop praying. Prayer bands. I haven't been able to be in our Thursday morning prayer band because I've been taking care of Pastor Rita, but she's getting stronger every day. She, she'd be here today, but just can't sit through two services. So she'll be here for the second service, but she's getting stronger and more and more independent, thank the Lord. And so we're going to be back, and we've been missing. I didn't mean that the way it came across, but... <laughs> I'm getting tired of fixing scrambled eggs for myself. Okay, I won't be saying this in the second service. Um, we've got to, we got to be at prayer. And it is, listen, prayer is the dipping seven times. In a sense, there's no end to the dipping we need to do. But if we don't keep dipping, we're going to miss out on what God has for us. Because these things only happen by prayer. Don't lag in prayer in your private life and in the corporate expressions of prayer here at Westgate Chapel. Next one. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. Raise your hand if you belong to Jesus Christ. All right, then the command is be thankful. And I think where some preachers have gotten this wrong, it, it, they, they preach be thankful for all circumstances. And listen, when those plumbers 
We're digging an $80,000 hole to fix our plumbing. I, there was no way I could be thankful for that, right? We started freaking, and I won't tell you who came out to fix our, our hole in the ground, but, but um, we, we're, that, that's foolish. That's denial. We're not saying be thankful. God's not saying be thankful for. He's saying be thankful in. How are you thankful in difficult circumstances unless you keep an account of the goodness of God that's come to you and me in the land of the living. I know we can all get, me included, grumpy over passing circumstances and situations, but for crying out loud, good, gracious people, if we just took a list and went back, I could be here all, literally all day remembering all the things that God has done in my life that for which I'm thankful. And if I keep that thankful attitude and realize that I'm not the one who earned or was in any way deserving of any of his good and gracious gifts and yet he has showered them on Pastor Rita and me over and over and over again sometimes when we're the least deserving if we keep that attitude then we can in all circumstances keep the right kind of perspective of what we're going through and keep our hearts clear and open before the Lord and each other then the next one, this next one deserves a whole sermon. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. See, Paul is just throwing the kitchen sink in here. Don't stifle. And that word stifle comes from the same word of throwing a blanket over a fire. Seen those commercials where there's a kitchen grease or oil fire and people try to put water on it and it just makes it worse? And they've got this special blanket now you can throw over a grease fire. And, and, and so Paul is saying when the Holy Spirit breaks out, he breaks out in fire. And that fire can sometimes be disturbing. It can be alarming. I wasn't going to mention this, but we, we got a little bit of pushback. The day one of the gals uh, I invited, one of the gals was over on the side just worshiping the Lord with that banner and I invited her up to the platform and because some people didn't see me invite her up, they assumed that she'd come up on her own authority and they took offense at that and I'm not saying they were quenching the Holy Spirit, but we got to be careful because the fire of God isn't always in the same kind of box and it's not always understandable and, and, uh, and you need to know that as church leadership, we're, we're keeping an eye on things all of your pastors, elders and deacons, we're watching things. We don't want things to get out of control. We want things to be biblical. But sometimes fire is going to, is going to be a little awkward. Sometimes it's going to be a little uncomfortable for all of us. And, the, and Paul is saying, don't stifle it. Don't throw a blanket on it. All right? And then the next one, you could preach a sermon on this. Do not scoff at prophecies. But test everything that is said and hold on to what is good. And the word scoff means to treat something with contempt as completely worthless. But Paul does, see the balance? I love God's word. Don't, don't uh, scoff at prophecies and make light of them. And those of you who are new to Westgate and new to Pentecost, because Pentecost and the expressions of Pentecost have been so criticized and ridiculed even by a lot of the evangelical movement. You could maybe even come, unfortunately, with some of that baggage. And scripture is saying here, don't scoff at it. But then rather than just leave it at that, Paul says, but test everything. And what are we tested by? The word of God. And the spirit of the person. Sometimes here, we've had the right words and the words have been consistent with Scripture, but, but the Spirit has been off. And so we've gone to the person privately so as not to embarrass them and talk to them about it. And by the way, can I just say, since we're sort of on a roll here, that's the test that really, to me, is the test of being used in the gifts is if you're willing, assuming the person comes to you with a gentle spirit, if you will take correction, that means the Holy Spirit is really working on you. If you resist correction when it comes to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, then we got a bigger problem. All right? Might as well just say that. Hold, test everything that is said 
including what you hear from the pulpit. That's why it's important for you to be men and women of the word so that whatever comes from this pulpit or any other teaching venue, and we've got a proliferation of voices now accessible to everybody on YouTube and everything else, but, but test it. Don't get, don't get blown around by some strange wind or doctrine that's not consistent with the word. Test it, but then hold on to what is good. That means hold fast, right? All right. We'll see if I've got a job by, next, by Monday. <laughs> Stay away, verse 22. Stay away from every kind of evil. See what I meant by this kind of shotgun. Just bam, Paul just covers. It's all those kind of things that, that no wonder when he was preaching in, in Troas, uh, one of the guys fell off the, out of the window of the third floor because Paul kind of goes on. Kind of like some other people we know, right? So here are the last, the last verses. I love this. Now may the God of peace make you, oh, Westgate, I pray this over you. May the God of peace make you and me holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Can I just stop and say something about verse 23? I've heard down through the years, I've heard people do whole teachings by carefully parsing out and separating. Well, this is for the spirit and this is for the body and this is for the soul. And, and I believe, obviously, we, have, we're, we are tripartite. We're body, soul, and spirit. Uh, but, but just be wary of teachings that grab one, pull it out of context, and focus just on that. Because in reality, God is three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in reality, we are three in one. And you can tell me my soul is my mind and my intellect and my spirit is something else. But in reality, when I'm responding to God or I'm reading the word, I'm not thinking, okay, is this my soul? And so you can get all, you can get all pretzled up over something like that. Just we're one in Christ Jesus, right? Just throw, throw that in there. God will make this happen, body, soul, and spirit kept blameless. Not up to you and me, thankfully, although we are partners. But God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful, Westgate. Dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss. I'm not going to make you do that. <laughs> I command you. In the name of the Lord, to read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. Paul is using his apostolic authority to command that this letter be read. And for the most part, these letters were not just read in the local congregation, but were circulated. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Westgate, thank you for listening. Thank you for opening your heart to the last 14 verses. Thank you for being patient with me and hopefully thinking the best of me with verse 12 and 13. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be on us all to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.